You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. It would be awesome if if uh, if somebody made something with these guys, like the Expendables, but instead of like old action heroes, old Asian villains, you know, Asian bad guys. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Tuesday. It's July the 28th. It's another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Thanks again for subscribing. And if you're not a subscriber yet, uh, please do so now. We are on Podbean. We are on iTunes. We are on Stitcher. And so maybe soon coming to SoundCloud, depending upon if anybody actually wants me to go there. But uh, really quickly, before I get to the interview with Patrick and Pino, uh, I just want to say, you know, just a few things in film news. Uh, one obviously is Pixels bombed the box office. Um, I don't know if who, if you saw that coming or maybe not, but either way, uh, and also funny enough, the uh, number one movie in China right now is Monster Hunt, which actually set a box office record for the highest grossing domestic film ever in China. And uh, for, for those of you who are interested, I'm going to post the trailer below. And, uh, you know, tell me what you think of it. And uh, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. Um, the reason I bring it up is because both movies are kind of similar in the fact that it's real live, uh, real, uh, you know, live action mixed with uh, 3D animation. And, you know, tell me what you think. But anyways, uh, enough about me and all about movies, in, you know, in China. Uh, so, episode 65, Patrick and Pino. We talk about his uh, feature film, which is called uh, Awesome Asian Bad Guys. We talk about some of the people that he wish he could have gotten. Uh, We talk about just a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, And I really know you'll you'll, you'll like it. So again, uh, if anybody, if you ever want to contact me, please feel free. It's you know, DaveBullis.com. There's a contact form right on there. And again, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. And I guess enough of me rambling. Uh, So episode 65 with Patrick and Pino. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. Hey everyone, thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Joining me today is Patrick Impino. Uh, Patrick is an Actor and producer, and he's known for The Void, Mr. Sadman, and of course, Awesome Asian Bad Guys. Uh, Patrick is a graduate of the University of Chicago, and he earned his MFA in cinema from the film program at San Francisco State University. Patrick, how are you, sir? Good, good, Dave. How you doing? Pretty good. Uh, it's pretty hot here in Philadelphia right now. Yeah, yeah. How, how hot are you talking? Um, I... Well, I don't have an exact temperature, but <laughs> I put my head out the window and I was like, oh my God, what the hell is going on here? So um, I've got like – you can't see it obviously, but there's like – I have my air conditioner kicked on. Like right before I was ta- – like right before we started this interview, I ran out to like make sure my air conditioner was down even lower. Oh, man. Yeah, it's is – it- is it like humid out there too? Very humid. That that's what's killing me right now. It's just how humid it is. Yeah, I just I just can't do the humidity, man. I mean, it was hot here. It was like 90s for a while, but it's like a a dry heat, you know what I mean? Not so oppressive as the as the humidity out there on the East Coast, but uh, you know, hopefully hopefully it passes. Yeah, it's it, it's just one of these. It, the worst part is whenever I do these the the podcast, I can't actually have a fan on anywhere near me. So like, it's if <laughs> I'm like depending on that central air to pump in some cold air. Uh, <laughs> so just you know, but yeah, it's just one of those humid days. Um, but thanks for everyone for listening to me talk about the Philadelphia weather. Um, <laughs> I'm just I'm just, I'm just k- killing everyone's time right now talking about the weather here in Philadelphia. Uh, but you know, uh, to get to something more interesting, uh, you know, Patrick, could you just give us a little more, a little bit more about your background, you know, and how you got started in film? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. I was born. Uh, 
uh, in San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley. Um, I went to college in Chicago, came back, went to uh, uh, went, went to film school at San Francisco State, and uh, moved to LA, and then just uh, you know started making like films, independent films, short films, and then um, fast forward to 2011, and uh, uh, I met this dude, Stephen DiPianco, who uh, became my partner in. Uh, a YouTube channel uh, slash uh, media studio that we started called the National Film Society. We started, uh, we became part of uh, PBS Digital Studios, which is an online uh, a YouTube uh, network. And uh, then we uh, decided one day to make something called Awesome Asian Bad Guys, which is uh, which is what we're um, which is out right now. You know. So, you know, I wanted to I always ask this because you you actually went to to film school. Yeah. Getting out now, what are your thoughts on on the whole film school debate? Uh, what's the debate? The debate is <laughs> <laughs> the debate is you have some on the on this side that say the that film school is it necessary, and then you have the other ones who say yes, it is necessary. Um, everyone has their reasons why, but I just wanted to get your you know your own experiences and opinion of, on the matter. Yeah, um, I I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think it's helpful in a lot of cases, but I also think like. Um, you know, like there's no reason that you have to go to film school. Both Steven and I went to different film schools. He went to uh, NYU and, um, you know, and I've known a lot of people to go to some of the bigger film schools like USC, UCLA, uh, Cal arts, um, and stuff like that. And, you know, there's, there's been people who have like uh, positive experiences and negative experiences. Um, for me, uh, I, I went to San Francisco state because, um, it was, in all honesty, I didn't want to take a standardized test again ever in my life. So I looked for schools that didn't require like the GRE. So, um, and I also looked for schools where I wouldn't have to go into huge debt. But, um, you know, and I loved it. I loved the experience. I think like for me, it was uh, something, a place where I could really have a lot of uh, fun and like exercise some, uh, some stupid ideas, get some bad, bad ideas out of my system, you know, bad films out of my system. Um, and, uh, and, and try to learn something. Um, you know, that being said, like, you know, when you get into, when you go to film school, a lot of it is like, you know, who you end up working with and knowing afterwards. So, um, you know, you, you hear this all the time, like, uh, oh, you know, make friends with people and, and, and I guess create like that network. And I think those are things that I've found, uh, from other people who have say gone to some of the bigger film schools that they've been able to fall back on. It's not true for everybody, but, um, I've known people actually to go to some of these schools just for the network. You know, and, and that's actually one of the, the things that gets brought up a lot is the the networking opportunities. Uh, for you know, I a couple episodes ago, I had on uh, Richard uh, Walter, who is you know teaches um, at uh, UCLA, and he mentioned that you know for their network alone, it's worth the price of the tuition. Uh, and he po- and he points to so- and you know his graduates. Some of his graduates have written movies for Steven Spielberg. Other ones are doing this and that. So that's you know that's one of the things that he uses to to sort of you know say yeah you should go to well again like you said though that they have the bigger programs and you see it USC UCLA. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's all about the the opportunities, and you know, like 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 what you make of them. I mean, that's 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 kind of like something you you know people's parents tell them, right? And all of a sudden, you realize, oh yeah, it is what you kind of make of it, right? So um, you know, for those people who don't really want perhaps like the structure of a school or like to have to quote unquote answer to so, like assignments or professors, then maybe it's not for you. And you can find out that, you know, you create your own work and you create your own network in other ways, right? Like obviously like some of these kids who grew up on YouTube, uh, they, a lot of them, I have no idea, but I assume none of them have gone or not none of them, that many of them haven't gone to film school, but they've developed, developed their own networks from what they've done. And so, um, you know, I think it's all about, you know, there's a million ways to get to the same place. And I think, um, it's, it's about like, you know, the best and the best way for an individual to get somewhere, you know, if you're very like driven, then, <clears throat> you know, maybe you have the personality where you don't have to be in school for it. But if you really thrive on structure and kind of like, you know, slowly learning the ropes of how to do things and being in a, uh, being in that kind of environment, then 
uh, then maybe film school is for you. Yeah, and, and you know that, that's a, a very good point to make. And you know, and, and again, you know, I, I know. Uh, oh, that's uh, the, you know the Trey Parker, Matt Stone. You know they they came um, from out, almost out of nowhere because they went to school in Colorado, and I mean the school that they went to, they didn't have like a very well known uh, film program, at least to my knowledge. I might be completely wrong, but but uh, you know, and they and look what they've did. I actually the reason I bring those up is uh, bring them up is because I actually am reading a book by their producer for Cannibal the Musical, which they actually made while they were in college, and um, he actually talks about. Where they got the money? It's called um, it's called Spadoinkle. I don't know if you've ever the book is called that. I don't know if you've <laughs> ever, I don't know if you ever seen Cannibal the Musical, but um, no, I haven't. It's a it, it's hysterical, and it also if, if you like South Park in any way, shape, or form, you'll like uh, Cannibal the Musical. Okay. Uh, basically, it's a it's a musical about. Albert Packard, who was a real life guy who actually went camp in, into this expedition deep in Colorado and ended up, you know, eating some people. <laughs> I think I know that story. I think I've heard that somewhere in my lifetime. I will look it up. <laughs> I will. I will look it up. Indeed. Is it um, so? It's a movie musical, or it's actually on like live performance. It's a movie musical, but right now it's actually coming out now as its own stage production as well. Oh, sweet. I saw the Book of Mormon and that was fun. So um, I will have to check out something about a cannibal that should probably be even better. <laughs> yeah, a Book of Mormon I think is going to play until the earth goes into the sun. So, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, think, uh, I think that is probably the best musical I've ever seen in my life out of the – Two musicals I've seen in my life. It was better than Cats. <laughs> yeah, it, it was very good. I, I'm usually not a musical guy. I'm more like a um, a David Mamet type guy. Mm, but yeah. Uh, yeah, even I agree. Like that was that was very well done, and it was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, it, well, just, just you know, just to sort of before we move on to talking about your other projects, when you were uh, in college, you know, create, you know, and you were saying you to get some of the, the these projects out of you, uh, you know. When you were creating some of these projects or your entire time there at college, you know, did you sort of see what what uh, you had at your disposal, meaning like locations, stuff like that, and then work backwards? Or did you, you know, maybe for like your last project, try something a little more ostentatious and to try or something more ambitious and try to, to do something that was like, you know, com- you know, we'd have to really, you know, uh, go outreach, you know, reach out to get some stuff that maybe I've had before, if you know what I mean? Um, uh, I... I tended more just to kind of see what I had and then work backwards, you know. Um, I mean, when I was in college, like I, I wanted, I thought about making films, but then it wasn't until after I really got out of uh, college and and uh, before film school and then going to film school. Um, a lot of it was just, uh, uh, you know, like I remember my thesis film. Um, it, like I think everybody had this, uh, you know, like this idea of what a thesis film is supposed to be, and it's like this big you know, big production and, you know, you really kind of go for it. You shoot it on like real film and, and all this other stuff. I, I, I made mine like for 500 bucks, like on, you know, like one of these really old, like one of these Canon digital cameras that came out in the early 2000s, you know. Um, I was really of the mindset of just kind of like taking um, an idea and then just trying to get it out as as, as quickly as as possible. Um, you know, like as I've, as I've moved on, it's like, oh man, you see what you can do and what other people can do with, with like the, the big fun tools and stuff. And, and, uh, I'd love, you know, like those are awesome. But I think just starting out, it was like, you know, let me, let me just see, let me like a kind of explore. And then you could be like quickly like, oh man, that was garbage. I'm going to just, you know, throw it away, you know? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, you know, it, when when you look back now, you can see a lot of the mistakes that you know. Like I, I look back at stuff that I've made, and I, it's you know the mistakes. You, you can see that more mistakes even more than other people, because uh, you know you, I'm, I'm sure you know you, you've shown when you show things to other people, sometimes they don't even notice other things, and then but to you, it's like standing right out in front of you. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, or you've seen something like a thousand times, you know, and you, you know, like things that you try to fix, you've, you've poured hours into it. And so you can't help but see like the, the flaws. But I mean, I think that's the beauty of, you know, putting it out there and letting it go finally, because other people can see it. And, you know, 
uh, most most people don't notice those things, you know, and and they just kind of want uh, uh, they they want like a, a great entertaining story, something that they that'll engage them, you know. They're not right off the bat trying to like you know look for all the uh, the the fixes and like the and all the places you've screwed up, right? Um, that's for that's for later down the road, but. Uh, yeah, I think uh, 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 lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time on this podcast. <laughs> I've done that on camera before, lots of times. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, uh, so you know, now that you know, just I, I want to just sort of move on and talk about uh, you know some of your other projects, you know, uh, and particularly awesome Asian bad guys. Mm-hmm. Now I wanted to ask you, you know. How did you – just starting at the beginning, and the beginning is the script obviously. So I wanted to ask you, how did this script or this – actually, I should say this concept idea come about? Well, the concept – so like I, like I mentioned, uh, me and my, my friend Steve had this uh, have this YouTube channel called National Film Society. And uh, like a month into it, we made this video called <clears> – <throat> excuse me, called uh, – we made this video called Awesome Asian Bad Guys where we just talked about our favorite – uh, Asian villains from movies and TV that we grew up watching in the 80s and 90s and you know you we realized that like you know the this is like a thing <clears throat> in movies right like there's always like an Asian dude who's a bad guy who's like he's like you know badass he can fight he can shoot guns he can like cut you up with swords and everything and he doesn't say much if anything at all and then he just dies you know he gets killed by the hero uh, in some really just egregious way, you know, like um, like getting blown up by an exploding tip arrow in Rambo Two, or um, or like getting killed by an ice cream cone or something, you know. And and we were just like, oh, this is kind of fun. We made this two minute video, and at the end, we were like, it would be awesome if if uh, if somebody made something with these guys, like the Expendables. But instead of like old action heroes, old Asian villains, you know, Asian bad guys. And we kind of just threw it out there. It was like just something to, to wrap up the video. And then, you know, we got some good responses from it. And people were like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And then all of a sudden we we're like, you know, when we decided like, oh, let's make something. We we're like, let's make this, you know. <clears throat> and so um, we, uh, Steve and I reached out to uh, some friends and supporters and stuff Uh we, we pulled on a few producers, uh, this guy Milton Liu, um, Diana Williams, Phil Yu, and uh, Milton was our writer, and uh, we decided to, to kickstart the thing. And um, it was kind of like a, a different process because we didn't have a script. We had like a concept. And then we just like made a Kickstarter video and, and um, Phil, our producer, he, um, our executive producer, he, he has like this really popular Asian pop culture blog called Angry Asian Man. And, um, you know, once he got kind of like on board, it was a lot easier to, to get people to like buy in and that we, you know, that Steve and I weren't just like these, you know, crazy lunatics who had a, this ridiculous idea. And, uh, we did a Kickstarter. We raised fifty-four grand, like at uh, in October of twenty twelve. We shot in twenty thirteen, screened it around twenty fourteen, and now it's out. And, and you know that that is an awesome story. I want to, you know, how everything sort of came together. Um, you know, I actually have heard of that blog, by the way, the Angry uh, Asian Man, mm-hmm. and I didn't understand if that was like if he was serious or if he was like, this is sort of like a parody account. So it, could you, is it, is he, is he serious Patrick or is this like a, is like a parody account? Phil Yu is not that angry of a person. <laughs> um, he's had this blog for a long time and it's, it's, it's not a parody at all, okay. but like the name is just like, you know, it, it's, it's a pop culture blog and he talks about, you know, things that are, are of importance to like, you know, Asian Americans, whether it's like, uh, uh, political things like, you know, current events, uh, or entertainment type stuff. Like those are all things that kind of like cover the scope of his interests and everything. Like he has a film background, like a, a journalism background. And so, um, it's just all kind of combines in one place. So he's not necessarily angry. Uh, it's just the, the moniker, uh, I believe that he came up with. And, uh, a lot of people think like, Oh man, this guy's just, what's, what's this guy mad about? But he's not really that angry. He's a good dude. 
Very good, dude. <laughs> okay, that, that that's good to know. Because uh, I, <laughs> I was wondering if, you know, maybe he screams all his blogs or something or whatever. But, uh... <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. Okay, well, you know, I'll have to uh, check out a site then sometime. So, uh, you know, just to, to sort of take a step back, talk about crowdfunding, awesome Asian bad guys, you know, uh, I wanted to ask you, how did you put together your whole campaign? I mean, that's sort of like the million dollar question, right? Because everyone always wants to know what was the secret sauce of a successful, of a successful campaign. So, you know, uh, could you give us, the, you know, a little, uh, you know, any tips or any uh, insight to uh, your successful campaign? Sure. Um, I think a lot of it was um, just putting uh, putting a lot of like, the Kickstarter, right? Like it always starts strong, and then there's like those weeks where it's just flat, and and uh, and then maybe if you're lucky, like you you finish off and you and you get your goal. But during those weeks, they were stressful because what you really don't want is to like. You know, no one wants to like kind of fail in public, right? And um, because you also like tell everyone you know you're doing this, then all of a sudden if it kind of goes kaput, then you're like, ah, I can't really, you know, ignore that that happened. But, um, you know, a lot of it was just constantly uh, outreach, um, you know, creating content, whether they were graphics or videos. Um, we did uh, a lot of like these webathons um, where we would do things like, you know, take take shots of alcohol for money uh, if people pledged during that span uh we would sing songs just goofy goofy stuff um and you know people and also we we brought like you know some of our cast on because a lot of the people that were into uh that were part of a lot of our backers were like you know super stoked to see some of the people that were in uh and taking part of the project and i think a lot of it also helped that um you know steve and i had been making youtube videos for about a year at that point and just kind of like the shameless self promotion <laughs> of getting people to try to like watch our videos and um also uh you know it, it kind of melded well you know what i mean it was like it just it didn't miss a beat but it, it just kind of ramped up a little bit more and uh you know it, it helped like having again like uh, uh uh like a big like a big team a strong team constantly pushing because you know people know is what i know what it's like when it's just kind of you hustling an idea but when you have like a team it's it's uh it's it's way more uh way more effective yeah i i couldn't agree more you know uh i've done crowdfunding myself and uh the first two times were in 2009 and that's when kickstarter wasn't around then it was just indiegogo right and um believe me it was like the, the the question I had to answer every single time was, "What is crowdfunding?" And the second question <laughs> is, "What's Indiegogo?" <laughs> right, right. Like, is this is this legal? You know, <laughs> is this? Uh, uh, why are you asking for money? You know, and I mean, who does that, right? But now, now everybody does it, and uh, you know, you get all the Kickstarter like posts and emails on Facebook and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that's how you know when you're you're in the film industry now is your entire timeline and Twitter timelines are just nothing but kickstarters and uh all sorts of other stuff. And uh you know, I, I I sometimes I'm just like my God, you know. Uh, I, I open up my Twitter on my phone. And I'm like, geez, it's just you know nothing but you know new film projects from. Uh, and you know what really gets me too, Patrick, is when they don't even yeah. inter- introduce themselves. Like I meet random people all the oh, time on right. Twitter, and they don't even introduce themselves or say, "Hey, Dave, what's going on?" They just go right into, "Hey, I need money. Give me now." And you're like, "What the hell?" Right, right. Because we're already at a point, man. We're like everybody's so so inundated with those, right? That like um, that you know, there's kind of a a, a craft to it, right? Because you really have to get through people's filters at a certain point. You know, there's like there's like a little bit of a, a you know, sometimes there's with different people at different times, crowdfunding like uh, 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 fatigue. You know, yeah. and um, it's it's. It, I don't know. Like I, I haven't done a crowdfunding, um, you know, campaign in a while, or or uh, or helped with one. So I don't know if it's like tougher now than it was a few years ago because it's more popular now. But there's just so many more of them. So I don't know. Uh, it's it's uh, it'll be interesting if and when I have to do one again. Yeah, you know, a, a lot of I, I want to word this correctly. I think a lot of people have sort of seen this and seen other people do it and they said like hey that seems easy and then they get into it and 
it's like, oh my God, this is a full-time job. So not only do I have to work my other full-time job, I got to come home and do this full-time job. And, you know, I've seen so many crowdfunding campaigns that have crashed and burned and immediately that person's back up on you know Twitter or Facebook, crowdfunding doesn't work. This thing's all rigged, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've, I've seen some things and it's, it's one of those things too, right? Because like if you've done one and, and you put the work in, like when someone else – is like okay, it's so easy. You know, they, it seems like they're just kind of like they, they believe it's so easy just to put it up, you know, do a little video on your computer and ask for money, and then like it'll come. You know, like I've seen people do things, and like I'm like, you know, are you are you serious? You know, like you know, there's there's great projects, but then sometimes you get a couple like a, like the ones I think you, you you're referring to, or maybe you've seen before, where they just don't understand. Like they're not like you know, that there's, there's something, there's a give and take, you know what I mean? There's an effort that has to be made. You actually have to see that effort, right. For me to care about what it is that you're doing. Like I've seen people who, who will like, uh, uh, you know, do a, uh, a, Actually, I'm not going to talk about it. Too. It might come up with somebody else, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but you know what I'm saying. It's like uh, uh, when they don't put the effort in, you're just like, oh, you know what? Not I'm not even watching this. You know? Yeah, I, that's exactly right. You know, and uh, it, it's some some of the things that I've seen on on some of these uh, crowdfunding campaigns, whether it's you know they don't have a video or. I look at their perks and it's like, uh, you know, hey, uh, $10 gets you a thank you tweet. Uh, $50 gets you a postcard or something. I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, who created this? Like, right. you know, uh, as like a thank you tweet is just, should be anyway. That should just be common courtesy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and it's just uh, some of this stuff. And then, you know, it, it, it's just eventually, you know, that's why. Uh, I've I you know anyone who ever comes to me privately and just asks for any help like I I've given a, some people help before and I'm always like look networking is the first thing and then sales is like the second thing because what I mean by that is you have to have a if you have a list of people that you know and have talked to they're more open to hear your sales pitch than some random stranger who you know who you've never met before yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and i've I've seen some of those um uh, some of those campaigns where the where the uh the perks or rewards or whatever it's like oh for 10 grand like you get a credit and you can visit the set flight not included you know what i mean it's like these just random random things and it's like really are you really that kind of like full of your your you, the lack of perspective, you know what I mean. Sometimes, and it's like I don't mean to sound like an like a crotchety old man, but I'm like uh, I'm like I'm like come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you got to be the crotchety old man sometimes. So yeah. you, you got to be like you damn kids, get off my lawn. But um, trust me, I, I'm that way sometimes too, Patrick. I'm just like you know I'm I, I'm you know if you get hit up with so many crowdfunding campaigns, you're just like look guys. This is how you're screwing up, and this is how you're doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, exactly. Oh man, and uh, but you know, and I'm glad you guys were successful. Um, you know, Thanks. as a side note, I actually saw your project, and I m- did not remind myself to contribute because I would have obviously. Um, I'm a huge Asian movie fan, and obviously I would have contributed to this, but I just completely forgot to remind myself to contribute. So the next one, Patrick, I'll owe you one. Okay, awesome. So, I will so make a note of that. You put that in the bank and then, you know, sometimes you can, you know, charge me 10 grand to come to the set and <laughs> flight not included, right? <laughs> yeah. Lodging not provided, right. <laughs> I'll just drive there and sleep in my car. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, uh, I, so, you know, I want, now that you, you know, were funded and everything, you know, in this whole process of creating Awesome Asian Bad Guys, you know, where whereabouts did you actually reach out for casting? I mean, I know you have some pretty cool actors involved in here. So, did, you know, how did you go about reaching out to all of them? Um, well, we'd actually made a couple of YouTube videos with Randall Park and Aaron Takahashi. And, um, you know, the Asian American, like, entertainment community is pretty pretty uh a lot of people know each other you know because they all kind of <laughs> run into run in the same crowds and like you know <laughs> a lot of people go out for the same stuff you know um so 
a lot of folks knew each other and I think like uh, for us it was kind of like going after going to one person then the next and then the next and again like like I, like I've said having having a strong team and having Phil on board was was uh, important because um, in all honesty like it gave us more legitimacy um, and you know people had seen some of our videos and that was helpful too because it was like who are these clowns and then they would kind of be like oh let me click on this link that you sent me and see what and they're like oh okay they don't seem like complete idiots you know <laughs> so um, now they uh, uh, I think it was a process of just going like after one person and getting like them to, to buy in and then the next person then it's like kind of a snowball effect and you know the whole the whole time it was a big uh, uh, had like a big family vibe to it you know on set during the table read before we shot everything it was it was uh, it was it was very cool. And that, that you know that, that's great when you can actually get that synergetic effect uh, for the for the uh, cast, and I mean, and that's awesome too. Again, you know, back to networking. We were just talking about that, you know, and that's that's amazing. You were able to you know to reach out to them. So so you know, I don't want to say easily, but you know, you I guess you could say had less obstacles. Let's say to reach out to some of these people. You know. Yeah, there was a different path, you know, like, because I guess in the traditional sense, it's like, oh, you write a script and like, oh, you go to some actors, um, maybe you have to go through their agents or maybe like if you know somebody who knows them, you kind of like ask them to to, to talk to you or like ask for contact info, you know. So, uh, again, like I think um, just by uh, having made like, you know, so many videos and being out there and and uh, it was it was definitely it was definitely positive. It was definitely helpful. It would have been a lot harder uh, if we were more anonymous and we're just kind of like trying to uh, uh, reach people in, in a more um, indirect way. So um, I, I think that was yeah, that was that was hugely helpful. We'd probably still be trying to get cast if <laughs> if we hadn't made all those unit, uh, YouTube videos, we'd still be doing it now. <laughs> and, and you know and that's a great point to make and uh if there's one thing that i would definitely take away from from that it is you you guys really had a built-in audience but also to add to that that you which means you guys really had a the pre-launch lockdown meaning mm-hmm. that you had you know I always say a three month lead time at least for a project. That way you can just, it's talking about it to people. It's building up uh, an email list. It's building up a Twitter list. It's building up all that good stuff. And then when mm-hmm. you finally do launch the thing, it's not a surprise to everyone. Some people will always be a surprise too, but you know, at least, you know, your core group there will not be a surprise. Right. Right. We were, we, we were already kind of out there and we did, we'd been talking about the project and we been shooting videos to update everybody and keeping like, you know, I mean, that's, that's a huge load of work, you know what I mean? To keep churning out like the, the, the content and just keeping in touch with everyone who is like uh, generous enough to support us and to, to believe in, in what it was we were trying to do. So you know, uh, now that you uh, you you, you had the script and you, you had everything casted, at this point, you know when it was the first, you know, if we could go to the first day of filming, you know, I know that you and um, uh, Stephen actually co-directed this. Mm-hmm. So you know, how 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 did that directing style works? I know sometimes, you know, we could some, sometimes you know you could see things as white, he could see things as black. So you know, how did you guys work together uh, co-directing this? Uh, it was terrible. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that dude. Now, um, uh, it, it went it went well. I mean, we've been working together for uh, by the time we shot, I believe we've been working together for almost two years, and um, you know we developed a good shorthand um, of how we of how we do things, and we we talked about that actually ahead of time because we also know like it's it's difficult to have two you know two headed dragons sometimes, and you know a lot of it was just kind of talking about like you know, maybe one of us would focus on something on one day and then maybe we would like kind of just switch off, you know what I mean? Oh, I want to do this scene. I want to do that scene. Something you just kind of work out ahead of time. Cause I guess, um, you know, like it's, uh, you hear enough stories and it's like, Oh, we should actually, you know, address this and tackle this and pr- uh, prepare ourselves for like, the, you know, any, anything that might come up. 
and I think, you know, it's just, uh, it was helpful. You know, we, we, uh, we're good friends and we work together. Well, we have, uh, you know, we're very similar, but like, you know, but also very different, you know, we, we work hard, um, and, uh, we love what we do, but, uh, like, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's his own person. I'm my own person, but it's just one of those things. Like if, uh, if we hadn't, Again, like I, I keep mentioning like the the the, the two years of working together and, and and building up this body of work. But man, you put those like hours in, and all of a sudden it just uh, it it just kind of you know comes along, not necessarily seamlessly, but uh, it's it's a much much smoother ride. Now, just to ask a stupid question, but mm-hmm. how much did you storyboard? Oh, uh, we didn't. We we did like uh, uh, we did we did what, what do you guys <laughs> we did like overhead maps you know for uh, with our uh, cinematographer uh, Nasser and um, we we thought of storyboarding but it was just quick quick and dirty st- storyboards you know like stick figures and just when we needed to we were just trying to map out like uh, camera moves and and just uh, uh, blocking and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, since you and Steven worked together so much, I'm sure, you know, a lot of that was, you know, already figured out. You know, you had a lot of, I'm sure you guys had all your notes and you work with the DP and, you know, you were able to, you, since you were able to work together so much beforehand, I'm sure, you know, it wasn't such a, a such, such of a shock. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, uh, I don't think we storyboarded that much, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a question of just like, you know, getting the coverage we wanted. And, you know, we knew that, uh, even we knew that we couldn't like do crazy, crazy shots, you know? Um, and so we were just like, okay, we're going to be in this place. We, uh, scouted the location. We looked at how we were going to make it appear to be something else. And then we would set things up and then we would just kind of like get our shot list from that. Okay. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, that, that's, you know, uh, you know, very, again, you know, going back to you, you guys able to work together so much, but, uh, and which is good, you know, I, I mean, sometimes, you know, I, I have to storyboard like a madman and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know. It, it's, it's just, it comes down to whatever I think you're most comfortable with. Uh, because right. sometimes I've worked with like more experienced, like one thing I've learned on film sets is always get a experienced DP. And some, mm-hmm. some DPs are like, don't worry, Dave, I know what a medium shot's going to look like. You know, it's like- <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I, I'll storyboard things where like, you know, it's, it's, it's getting a little bit more complex, you know, I'll storyboard like a sequence if, if it needs to be storyboarded. Um, uh, I mean like, like fight scenes, you know, sometimes need to be storyboarded. And that whole, that whole like experience was like completely new to me. And, and, and so that was, that was, uh, yeah, that was kind of, that was a trip. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, yeah, doing some fight scenes, I always, uh, I always left it up to my, my fight cinematographer. Cause I, I did a, a fight sequence like that a couple of years ago. And, uh, uh, for this film project we did. And, uh, I, I ended up like, we we were choreographing this thing for way way too long, um, and then you know it's one of those times where just like literally days got away with you uh, away from you so quickly, and yeah. yeah, I mean, and as you know, as as most things do in filmmaking, right? So right. So you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, in in casting uh, awesome Asian bad guys, I meant to ask you this: was there anyone you tried to get but you couldn't get? Oh yeah, I mean, there like um, there's. Can I, I mean, guess? Can I guess? Yeah. Can I guess one of them? Yes, go for it. Was one of them James Hong? Oh yeah, 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 absolutely, man, absolutely. James Hong, like um, a lot of people that we know know him, and so um, <laughs> I always joked around that like uh, 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 we asked him four times if he would do it, if he would be part of Awesome Asian Bad Guys, and four times he turned us down. And I kept joking that we kept asking him because he's so old. I thought he would forget and say yes, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> But no, he's a really sweet, sweet, sweet guy. Um, very, very like good dude. He was shooting a movie at that point, so he, you know, like at a certain point, we we're just like, oh, okay, it's not going to work. Like maybe next time, you know. And um, but he's he's rad, you know. We want definitely wanted, you know, uh, Lopan, you know. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> um, uh, Big Trouble in China is one of the all time greats. Oh, um, my favorite movie of all time. Yeah, and so I think. Um, yeah, he was he was super cool. I think he was shooting like R.I.P. R.I.P. 
RIPD or mm-hmm. something that, uh, and, um, yeah, he just, he just couldn't, couldn't make it. But, um, we also wanted Bolo. Um, uh, do you know, do you remember that guy? Oh like, yeah. From totally, Bloodsport, Enter the yeah, Dragon. Yeah. Bolo you. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We wanted him and it's kind of funny. Like we were searching for him, you know, cause it's, it's like people knew him or knew where he was. And there was like, he, Apparently he works out at like a gym, um, I guess relatively close to where Steve lives. And so the idea was that Steve was just going to go to the gym and try to like uh, solicit him for uh, for awesome Asian bad guys, ask him for uh, he would want to do it. But um, it never happened. Like I, I think uh, he probably would have gotten his his neck you know, snapped in half. But um, it was uh, he, he definitely was somebody that we that we were hoping to get as well. Uh, you know, I, that was funny. That's actually the first two guys that came to my mind was James Hong. Number two was Bolo. Uh, number three was going to be Gerald Okamura. Mm, yeah, Gerald. We, we, we know him. We've met him. He's come. He's a, he's a very good dude. He, uh, lives down here, out here in LA. And, uh, uh, yeah, like he's, he's awesome. I mean, would, would love to get him for the next one. Cool. So, you know, at some point down the line, would you ever do a sequel? Yeah, yeah. I mean, would love to, man. Like, in all honesty, it's like, you know, as we worked on this, it was like, oh, you know, we'd love to make like, uh, like, because there's so many bad guys, right? And there's so many things you could do with it. Um, We had an intern who made like, went through IMDb and made a list of bad guys. And it was like, man, I don't even know who these people are, you know, there's like nonstop, you know? And, um, and yeah, I mean, would love to make a sequel. Um, and would also just kind of love to like play off of like the Marvel universe in the sense and create like, um, our own awesome Asian bad guy universe where it's like, and even like, you know, awesome Asian bad girls, like, cause there's also like, you know, like Lucy Liu, like uh, Maggie Q. Like, there's there's tons of of, of of bad girls, and so it's like, oh, it's like it could be Avengers and Guardians of the Galaxy type thing, you know, and then have them meet in some like huge, uh, you know, epic Asian badness movie or something. And um, yeah, definitely something that uh, uh, we we want to explore and, and keep it moving forward. Yeah, you know, that would be a, a good idea. Awesome Asian bad girls. Uh, you could do like, you know, there's Gogo Yubori from uh, Kill Bill. Uh, mm-hmm. I forget her name off the top of my head. But, um, but, that, but that, you know, uh, uh, when you do make a sequel, let me know uh, because I think that would be awesome though. Uh, from what I've heard, by the way, Bolo is apparently just an absolute awesome guy. Oh, yeah? Wow. Um, how, how did you hear that? Just from people working on film sets that have awesome. <laughs> why, why did you hear something else? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my my silence betrayed me. No, no, no. Um, uh, no, because I think I just have this vision of who he is. Right, I have this vision of him from the movies I I watched as a kid, and I have this, which led to the vision of you know saying to Steve, hey, maybe you shouldn't go to the gym. He might kill you. you know? <laughs> Don't ask him if he needs a spotter. You know? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, he, you know, tight knit community and like, I'm sure he's a good dude. Everybody here, know, everybody here seems to know everybody else. And it's like, oh, do you know this person? Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Um, I'm very used to like growing up uh, my teens, I, I did Kung Fu. And uh-huh. like I, I met like a lot of the old school kung fu guys, like I mean old school, uh, where like you know you have guys over here, women over here, uh, you don't get a water break, you don't talk during class unless you're absolutely spoken to. Uh, so I'm like used to the old uh, strong fisted, iron fisted kung fu master type deal. Um, so maybe the, those guys I knew who worked with fellow were kind of that way too. Um, you know, and they did martial arts from when they were before they could even walk. Um, you know, so you know maybe that's maybe, maybe that is maybe you did make a good idea, but not having Steve go in and it's like, hey, hi, <laughs> hi, Mr. Jung, uh, can I talk to you? But you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would have made for a good YouTube video if he got his got his uh, got his ass kicked, but you know, <laughs> I mean, the, the man has fought Bruce Lee, so <laughs> I know, I know, that's that's impressive. 
I led beyond words how impressive that is. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, I wanted to ask you too, you know, what was, you know, the hardest part of filming Awesome Asian Bad Guys? You know, was there any particular day that was particularly hard or had just an absolute obstacle you guys had to overcome? Yeah, I mean, I think like um, there were, you know, just a, a couple things because we shot it in like seven and a half, eight days. I think uh, shooting um, some of the fight sequences uh, took some time uh, because it was like, you know, those always take time. And, you know, also adjusting to like people's schedules, you know, to be honest, like a lot of, you know, like we raised 54 grand on Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> a lot of times we, a lot of times like our, uh, some of our actors, you know, they had, other like other commitments come would come up and that was we understood that we knew that was going to happen because these guys are talented and constantly working and it's not like we were paying them much if anything no (laughs) and um and so they um you know part of it was like writing around their absences you know our 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 producer writer uh milton lou he you know he would kind of he would find out that oh so and so couldn't make it the next day, so we'd have to kind of write. He'd have to write around them and you know put them somewhere else and give them a reason why they're not going to be in the main you know in this particular scene anymore you know. And I think that to me is always like difficult, especially when um, you're on set you know doing the producing stuff and then you have to figure that stuff out like um, like during like during like you know some downtime or overnight on your own time. Yeah, and and you know that's that's one of the things you know I always say is producing is a skill in itself. Uh, you know, a lot of times, all, I mean, and this is this can be even you know sort of parallel to crowdfunding. People will see other people do it, and it's just sort of like, oh, anyone can do it, and then suddenly <laughs> it's like, oh my god, it's all this, uh, <laughs> and you, you just want to, and you know, then you know those people usually go, I'm so sorry, uh, I know we, this was all this entailed. <laughs> Right, right. It's like, you know, like, right, the the typical question, like, what does a producer do? I mean, like on a set like this, everything, right? Like, that's, that's just how it works, you know? Um, And uh, it's, it's not for the, uh, not for the faint hearted, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I wanted to ask you too, Patrick, you know, uh, what's next for you? And, and, uh, and Steven? Um, well, we, we were focusing a lot on just getting this out, you know, like getting it out. We worked with a company called Film Buff out in New York to, to get Awesome Asian Bad Guys out on, on digital pl- uh, VOD platforms like iTunes and Amazon, Xbox. Um, and now it's like, you know, we're still pushing it. And like I said, for me, it's, uh, uh, you know, I really think it's time now to like start thinking about the ideas of of moving it towards like a sequel or an awesome Asian bad girls version and what we could actually turn this turn this into and really have some fun with it um and you know there's there's some other ideas to to kick around as well but um i think those are things that uh that um are kind of at the top of the priority list okay very cool uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in closing, Patrick, you know, we've been talking for about, you know, 40 minutes now. Is there anything, you know, that we haven't discussed or anything I didn't cover uh, that you would like to say in closing? Um, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, uh, no. No, <laughs> no, man. Like, sorry. Like, <laughs> end of end of a Monday workday. Um, uh, I think you covered a lot of stuff. Just like you know, uh, I guess we could talk about where people can get it. Uh, that's actually my next question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and scene. <All> right. <laughs> so, so Patrick, uh, what can people find Awesome Asian Bad Guys online? Um, they can get it on our website, awesomeasianbadguys.com, dot com, um, where you can also get like the deluxe version and like you know some some cool t shirts like Bad Guys t shirts, Bad Girls t shirts there, and you can also get it on iTunes, Amazon Instant Video, Xbox, and Google Play, and maybe Vudu. Is it voodoo or voodoo? Uh, I think it's voodoo. Voodoo, right. So, you know, check it out there and, uh, you know, share it with your friends and tell your friends. And where do people find you at specifically uh, online, Patrick? 
Uh, they can find me on Twitter at uh, at Patrick Epino. Awesome. And do you have a website or anything? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's awesomeasurebadguys.com, which actually is also nationalfilmsociety.com. It forwards. So um, you can check us out there. Very cool. Uh, and everyone, by the way, I will link to all that good stuff in the show notes um, like I always do. So it's very easy to find all, all that stuff and just click on it. Uh, and you can you know talk to Patrick and, uh, <laughs> and t- check out Awesome Asian Bad Guys. And uh, as always, everyone, you can find me at DaveBullis.com. On Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. Um, feel free to send Patrick and I all your crowdfunding campaigns all the time. And, uh, you know, that was a joke, by the way, Patrick. I'm, I'm, I, was, <laughs> no, I wasn't being serious. I got so much money for crowdfunding campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, I just – actually, while we were talking, somebody uh, – like my phone went off. It's on silent. But it, I looked over and it's just like, hi, Dave. Check out my campaign. Like literally, that's all it says. I'm like, who, who is this person? Uh, uh, it, I swear, man, it, it's it's becoming like more and more prevalent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's, uh, it's it's the name of the game, I guess. Forward me that guy. I'm going to give him some money. No. <laughs> there you go. We've cr- we we have cracked the code of crowdfunding right here. <laughs> exactly. Patrick, I wish you the best of luck. Um, and again, when you uh, make Awesome Asian Bad Guys Part Two, uh, please please give me a, a heads up about that. Definitely will, Dave. Thank you so much for for having me. It was oh, fun. anytime, my friend. Anytime, uh, Patrick. I wish you the best and have a good night, buddy. You too. Take care, buddy. All right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis dot com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.